All right. Now, you remember Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul makes this great declaration, this great statement that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, Jew and Gentile. And then in chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20, he establishes the guilt of all humanity before God. See, this dire situation from which the gospel that he announces in, in 116 through 18, through which that, that uh, rescues us, or 116 and 17, and then 118, or 118 to 320, he paints that picture of humanity's situation and humanity's guilt. And then in 321 to 425, he lays out the doctrine of salvation uh, by faith in Christ apart from works of the law. And here's how Grant Osborne summarizes that section, 321 to 425. I read this to you last week. But he says, so Paul has now summed up his points in 321 to 425. His doctrine of salvation by faith alone apart from works is complete. At the heart of his doctrine is the fact that Christ's death was a sacrifice of atonement, propitiation, that paid the price for our sins, redemption, and resulted in God's legal decision to pronounce us right before him, justification, 321 to 26. The key is faith rather than observing the law, and this means that God is the God of the Gentiles as well as the Jews, 327 to 31. To prove this, Paul turns to Abraham, the father of the nation and the one who precedes Moses, showing that faith has precedence over the law as a means by which one participates in salvation. So that's, that, that's down through the end of chapter 4. Then in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, I had just read that last week, and I wanted to read that again, and then I'm going to repeat that short quote from Douglas Moo, who's a New Testament scholar, and then we'll pick up from there and go on. But in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, it says, Therefore, having been pronounced righteous from faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have had an introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but also we boast in afflictions, knowing that the affliction produces endurance, and the endurance proven character, and the proven character hope. And the hope will not put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still weak, at that time Christ died on behalf of the ungodly. For someone will scarcely die on behalf of a righteous man, though perhaps someone might even dare to die on behalf of a good man. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died on our behalf. Therefore, having been pronounced righteous by his blood, even more shall we be saved through him from the wrath. For if while being enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, even more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And not only that, but also we boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here's what Moose said. In this paragraph, Paul invites us to join with him in celebrating the marvelous benefits conferred upon the justified believer. The apostle speaks as one who is extremely happy and full of joy, quoting Luther. It is now the believer who is speaking. In fact, we might almost say singing. And he quotes that commentator, Leanheart. So, having been justified, Paul says in this text that having been justified, having been pronounced righteous through faith, having having been pronounced righteous through faith, that sums up the central teaching of chapters 1 through 4. Having been pronounced righteous by faith, that sums that up. By believing in Jesus Christ, who's the divine agent in God's climactic act of deliverance. That's who Jesus is. He's the center. 
the divine agent of this deliverance. Paul, the Romans, when he says we, he's talking about himself and the Romans. Paul and the Romans and all Christians have been justified. You see, all of us, all of us who have faith in Jesus Christ have been justified, declared innocent of all charges that have been justly brought against those who what sin and fall short of the glory of God. So we have been justified, we have been declared innocent of all charges. And as a result of that acquittal, we have peace with God. We as believers in Jesus Christ, we have redeemed people as Christians. We have peace with God. We are right with God. All is well with us. We have been reconciled. We have been, peace has been brought in our relationship with God. Rather than being enemies, we've been reconciled, as he says in in verse 10. And this peace, it comes through and only through, as he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It comes only through him. He's the only one through whom we receive justification, as it says in chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. And thus, he's the only one through whom we receive peace. Because as we are reconciled, acquitted, declared right, this peace with God comes. We are now right with God. That comes through Jesus Christ. Reconciliation through Christ. Peace through Christ. We are right with God. And Jesus, he not only brought us peace with God, he says that he also introduced us into this realm of divine favor. When he says we have peace with God, through whom also we have had an introduction by faith, into this grace in which we stand. So through Christ, we've had this introduction by faith into the realm of divine favor. We are the blessed sons and daughters of God. And I, I just, you know, what do you say about that? You know, we, we hear it so much and think about it so much that we can say it and yawn. And it's just crazy to say it and yawn. For someone to say that we are the blessed sons and daughters of God, that we've had an introduction by faith into this state of favor. So we, have, we are justified, reconciled, we're at peace with God. We are introduced into this state of divine favor. We are sons and daughters of God. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, there is so much. It's so uh, majestic. It's so big to say these things. That you almost like want to cover your mouth to say something that great. And here's Paul writing the Spirit of God through Paul. And having been justified through faith, Christians not only have peace with God, he says, but we also boast. We boast in the hope of God's glory. Now this boasting, this means that we are joyfully confident. In the hope, see, hope is an expectation. Sometimes we use hope as this idea, well, you know, I'm just kind of hoping it's this thing that's not really, uh, you know, do you think, well, I'm hoping it's going to happen. No, no, no. Hope is an expectation, you see. And here it's this idea of a joyful expectation. In fact, some of your translations will render the phrase exult or rejoice. That's a very common uh, nuance put on the word in this context because that's the idea that it's carrying here, this idea of being joyfully confident that we will enter into the consummated kingdom, that perfect eternal state where we will be all that God intends us to be. So here we are, we are right with God, we're at peace with God, we're justified, we're acquitted of all charges, so all is right with us us and God. We have been introduced by faith into this realm of divine favor in which we stand. And we boast, we rejoice in this great, with confidence, in this hope, in this expectation. We have this confident, joyful expectation that we are going to enter into. What is in store for us? We are going to enter into the glorious eternal state. That is what God is giving us. That is what he's giving us. Colin Cruz in his commentary He says here, he says, the glory of God about which we rejoice slash boast in hope is the restoration of the glory lost at the fall. The status humanity enjoyed being created in the image and glory of God was marred by sin. 
in the case of believers, this is in the process of being restored as we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it will be restored fully when our hope of sharing in the glory of God reaches its consummation in the new age. And he quotes Romans 8, which we will get to and park on a bit. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Thomas Schreiner, in his commentary on Romans, he says, The parallels in Romans chapter 8, 8, 17, 18, 21, 30, demonstrate that this glory is an eschatological, an end-time reality, not a present possession. The already, not yet character of Paul's eschatology. Now, that's a mouthful, but I've talked many times about the already, not yet. Now, I'm not going to detour again and do it. But it's very important. I've told you it's fundamental to New Testament theology. It's everywhere. And here you see Schreiner says, the already, not yet character of Paul's eschatology emerges in this paragraph. Believers are righteous in God's sight, Enjoy the eschatological covenant of peace and stand in the end time gift of grace. Nonetheless, the full promises of salvation have not yet been realized. We await the return and the consummation. And that's what Paul is saying here about the hope of God's glory. That's where we stand. We still await future glorification, which will involve moral perfection and restoration to the glory Adam lost when he sinned. Believers are certain now that the glory Adam lost will be restored to them. Indeed, the glory restored to believers will be even greater than the glory Adam once had, for believers will be conformed to the second Adam, Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 29. So Paul here with this idea, what he's talking about here, he says, look, that we, are, we boast in the hope of God's glory, that we are joyfully confident in the expectation of what will be ours by the work of God, that we are going to enter into the consummated kingdom, the eternal existence where we will share the glory of God. We will be in that perfect state of love. And I, you know, when you say that, do you understand that we live together in fellowship with one another where there's no question about motives or hidden agendas, or it's just pure love and fellowship in the very presence of God for eternity. It is the divine utopia, and that is what God has done. And so Paul says we rejoice in this and boast, and you say, well, that boasting sounds like an odd word, and it is, unless you get this this nuance to it or this, this sense of it. Boasting in human achievement is excluded by the gospel, right? I mean, Paul said that in Romans chapter 3, verse 27. In human achievement, boasting is excluded, but boasting because of the gracious provision of God in Christ, that's entirely proper, entirely appropriate. For example, 1 Corinthians 1, 31, 2 Corinthians 10, 17, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And you see the same idea in Galatians 6, 14, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. So here it is, we are rejoicing, boasting, just thrilled by and bragging on what God is going to do for us because of who He is. And so we're confident of that. That is what God is going to provide. Now, not only do Christians boast in the hope of God's glory, But we also boast, we also rejoice. He says in the very hardships, in afflictions, we boast to rejoice in the very hardships that might cause some to doubt that we really are at peace with God, that we really are in His favor, that we really are headed for glory. You see, that's how our world works, right? I mean, when you have these flicks and hardships, well, no, no, no. If God is really with you and he's blessing you, you ought to be in this bubble and be floating along. And that's what a lot of these people on television try to sell you. You say, no, no, no. You come on in and he'll put you in that bubble and you'll get a lot of money. You'll have a big house. You'll have a big car. You'll be free from all disease. And does anybody think that's, the, that's what you see in reading the New Testament? But they sell it. They got the places packed. And you go, how can, how can that be? But it is. It, it is. But he sits here and he says, look, that, that we, have, we rejoice in these hardships 
The very things that would cause people to doubt that we're at peace with God, that we're in his favor, that we're headed for glory, and we rejoice in those things because as we faithfully endure hardships, he says we prove our character, our spiritual stuff, which then serves to what? Strengthen our hope. A faith that's steadfast in trials. A faith, a, a faith that maintains hope in the faith of hopelessness comes out and comes through the other side with even greater hope than before. You see, so, so what on the surface it appears contrary to hope Difficulties, troubles, afflictions that look like that's contrary to you. Hold on, you're the blessed of God. You're sons and daughters of God. Well, doesn't this kind of make you doubt that? Well, see, as we maintain hope, endure afflictions in the face of hopelessness, we come through with greater hope. So this idea is what initially looks like it's contrary to hope. In the end, it proves to be a means of what? Strengthening hope. This is Abraham in 4.18. Abraham believed against hope on the basis of hope. You see, as you and I hold on and endure and say, look, I know this world is difficult. I know there are all kinds of storms. I know, as I've used that illustration from, from the old Star Trek, where, the, you, know, where you, you have one of the early uh, things, the, the pilot, where Christopher Pike is there with those guys. With the, he's captured on this uh, planet. And you've got these little guys, scrawny guys, I think, I think it was Talos was the planet. And you've got these little guys, tiny little guys with big heads, and they've got him trapped in this place. And he gets the idea that really how, what they're doing is they're controlling his mind with illusions. And so they make him think that there's a wall there when there's not really a wall there. And so he captures one of these dudes, starts strangling this guy. And while he's strangling him, he gets this image that he actually strangling this fierce monster. And he has to trust what he knows is the truth beyond what he sees. And you and I are like that in this journey, that you and I hold on to God. And there are times when difficulties strike us and you think, you know, how can this be? How can I be enduring this thing? And you hold on to the truth you know. You say, you don't allow what is seen in this world to shake you off. You, I know what it looks like, but I know something higher. And I will not let these kinds of things cause me to let go because I know the truth. And you are, okay, so that, I, I think this is the idea. So that as we have these difficulties, you and I in faith, we maintain our hope and we come through the afflictions, what? With even greater hope. You see, even greater hope. And I think that's what Paul's saying, why they rejoice in that. Now, the Christian hope, it will, he says, Paul says, it will not turn out to be misplaced. You see, and thus a source of shame. That's this idea. It would be stored, what he says here, well, I should have switched the slide so you could see what I was talking about. Okay, you see, but he sits here and he says, we boast in our afflictions knowing that affliction produces endurance, and the endurance proven character, proven character hope. And the hope will not put us to shame. It will not put us to shame. And the idea here is that we know that God is not making fools out of us. We haven't been duped. We haven't been played. It's not the idea that here's God. He's saying, go ahead, live your life for me. Sacrifice for me. Give everything to me. And at the end of that day, uh -huh. you were a fool for doing that. And then you're ashamed. You are ashamed just like you are when a con man takes your money. Well, why are you ashamed? Because I feel stupid. I feel I was duped. I'm ashamed that I allowed someone to take advantage of me. And he says, that will not be the case. That will not be the case, you see. And we, that the hope that we have will not put us to shame. It's not going to happen that way. And we know that God is not making fools of us, he says, because the Spirit has taught us how much God loves us. The Spirit has taught us how much God loves us. You see in verse 6, he says, For while we were still weak, and in the, up, up above it says, uh, God has poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, uh, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
For while we were still weak, at that time Christ died on behalf of the ungodly, and then he carries on, for someone will scarcely die on behalf of a righteous man. And in verse 7 and verse 8, the verses 6 through 8, they declare the wonder and the magnitude of the love on which our hope is founded. Our hope will not turn out to be a source of shame. It will not turn out to be, we will not turn out to have been duped. We will not turn out to have said, listen, I placed all my hope and trust in you and you suckered me. That will not turn out to be the case because the Spirit has convicted us of the depth of God's love and that love is demonstrated and shown. The magnitude and wonder of that love on which our hope is founded. He paints the picture of that. He said, look, human love at its best, at its best will motivate a person to give his life for a truly good person. You might see human love do that. That someone will marshal up everything and they will give their life for a truly good person. But he says, God, God sent his son, sent Christ to die, not for righteous and good people. That's not that. No, no. He sent his son to die for rebellious and undeserving people. Oh, yeah, for rebellious and undeserving people. And the point is that God's love is far greater in its magnitude and in its dependability than even the greatest human love. You see, so... Our hope will not turn out to be a source of shame because the Spirit has convinced us of God's love. He has given us that conviction in our heart. And that love, the love on which our hope is based, is mind-blowing. It is beyond the greatest of human loves in its magnitude and in its dependability. And it's a conviction of that love that the Spirit brings home to the Christian heart. That's what he says when the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Spirit. He has given us that conviction, that understanding, that depth of saying, listen, I know how things look. I know I'm struggling. I know my child just died. Is there a greater pain than that? I know my child just died, but I know God loves me. I am absolutely convinced. So though I can't sort through how the tremendous love of God winds up in this fallen creation allowing such things, I will not let that shake my conviction that God loves me like crazy. Because that cross that he has put just says that. Don't ever doubt it. Listen, I know how it will look to you sometimes, but never, ever doubt that I'm for you. I literally love you to death. That's it. See, and so Paul, the Spirit has given us that conviction, and that's what Paul is saying. In verses 9 and 10, he reiterates and he expands on this, the central idea of the certainty of this hope, this hope that we have, this expectation, what is in store for us as Christians. He expands on that, and the point is that if God has already done the more difficult thing, If he has already done the more difficult thing, which is to reconcile and justify unworthy sinners. He's already done that. He's already reconciled us, brought us at peace with him. If he's already done the more difficult thing, how much more can he be counted on to accomplish the easier thing, which is to save from wrath on judgment day, those who have been brought into such a relationship. If he's done the more difficult thing of bringing us into harmony with him, giving us peace with him, reconciling rebellious, hateful sinners with him, well, if he's already done that, then how much more can he be counted on to spare them from wrath on that day? And that's Paul's point, see? He will save them from wrath, those who he has already done the more difficult thing. We're saved, he says, from wrath by his life. Now, that's interesting. We're saved from wrath 
by his life. Perhaps he means we're saved from wrath by his life in the sense that, that his life is the glorious life of the resurrection. See, Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23. And by being in him, by being in Christ, we share the blessings of that resurrection life, which excludes wrath. You see, perhaps, perhaps that's what he means when he says that we are saved from wrath by his life. Or perhaps we're saved from wrath by his life and that the risen Christ continually intercedes for us. You see, maybe, that, maybe that's the idea. As Paul will say in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, and as is mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament, in Hebrews 7, 25, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, this idea that Christ... You know, when you fail, when you sin, we have one there who intercedes for us. You see, so it's this idea, maybe that's it, that through his life, you and I continually are cleansed. But in any event, see, Paul is saying, listen, this hope that we have of entering into this consummated kingdom in this eternal state of perfect glory, the divine utopia, that this hope that we have is something, see, that he expands on this, and he says, look, that is ours. I want you to know that. He's already done the more difficult thing, so you know that he's going to do the easier thing. You know that he's going to do that, and then he says that we're saved by, uh, from wrath by his life. Now, not only will Christians be saved, but as he stressed in the first four verses, we presently rejoice in all that God has given us in Jesus Christ. So it's not only this hope that we have of future salvation from wrath on judgment day and entering into the consummated kingdom, which of course we have, but we also rejoice now, you see. We rejoice presently in all that God has given us in Jesus Christ, the one through whom we have now received reconciliation, peace. Douglas Moo, in his commentary, he quotes John Chrysostom, who's a theologian from the, the late 4th, early 5th centuries, and Chrysostom says, and so the fact of his saving us, and saving us too when we were in such plight, and doing it by means of his only begotten, and not merely by his only begotten, but by his blood, weaves for us endless crowns to glory in. You see, do, do we get what God has done? And don't ever let that become just common, you know, I don't care. Stir it up in your heart. Because this is tremendous stuff. And I know it's mind-blowing. It's hard to sit here and internalize and ride on. And you have to get it and say, listen, what a thing we have. It's never a yawner. It's never, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm Christian. Yeah, yeah. No, I've been blessed by God. I've been given something that is just incomparable. And I celebrate it. I rejoice in it. I thank God for it. And we live to please him because he's blessed us this way. All right, now we're going to go into 512, chapter 5, verse 12 through 21. And there's some deep water here. Okay. There's deep water in a lot of these things. I understand that. So I just, I'm going to tell you how I see things, okay? I'm fallible, sinful, not inspired, a guy who's just trying to share with you how I understand things, okay? I'll give you my understanding, as I always say, you weigh it, and if it's the voice of God, I hope you heed it. If you don't, you go and keep studying, all right? He says in 5, 12 through 23, because of this, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, and through sin, death and in this way, death spread to all people because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not charged when there's no law. But death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression, who is a type of the coming one. But it is, a not, it, but it is not a matter of as the trespass, so also the gift. For if by the trespass of the one, the many died, even more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not as that which came through the one who sinned. 
for the judgment after one trespass resulted in condemnation, but the gift after many trespasses resulted in a pronouncement of righteous. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through the one man, even more will those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now therefore, as through the trespass of one man, condemnation came to all people, so also through the righteous deed of one man, the pronouncing righteous that leads to life came to all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. But the law entered in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace superabounded. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ugh. The basic point of this section is certainly easier than the details. Okay, the basic point is easier than the details. The basic point is this. The fact God has justified and reconciled his enemies through the death of one man. Isn't that what Paul's just been talking about? He says, you've been reconciled, you've been brought into a state of peace, all is right with you through the death of one man. One man's death has accomplished all that. And so the point here is that, look, the fact God has justified and reconciled his enemies through the death of one man, Jesus Christ, you see, that, that fact that he's done that, and can therefore be counted on what to save them from the wrath, because if he's done the greater, certainly he will do, uh, the, the more difficult, certainly he'll do the easier. So the fact that through one man we've been reconciled and will be saved from wrath, that's not as strange as it may seem. Because that is pretty mind-blowing, isn't it? That, that one person had such a tremendous effect and see, so his point is that, look, that idea of one person having, having a tremendous effect is not as strange as it may seem. It means that just as there existed a death-producing connection between Adam and his own, so there exists a life-producing connection between Christ and his own. You see, it's not as strange as it may seem. That is what Paul, I'm convinced, is making this point where he goes and shows the tremendous effects and benefits of Christ's death of one man affecting countless people. You say, well, how do, what's a, well, it's not that strange because there's an analog. You see, there's an analog. You have the, you have the death-producing connection to Adam, one man, and so the life-producing connection to Christ, one man. Now the thought, Paul begins the thought here in verse 12 where he says, just as through one man sin entered into the world and through sin death and in this way death spread to all people. So you're waiting for so also. Right? He says, just as through blah, 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 so also. Just as, so also. Where is it? Well, Paul digresses. You see, he digresses. He doesn't pick that thought back up until verse 18. You say, well, why is he doing that? You remember that Paul's dictating. You see, Paul's not sitting at a computer where he gets to say, okay, delete that. Eh, I want to put it this way. He's dictating to Tertius. And so Paul is saying this. He said, why does the Spirit work that way? The Spirit works through people. And he's working in the way people wrote. And so here's Paul. He's dictating. And so he begins this, and he does, he digresses for the verses. It's not until 518, or I hope I have up to here. You see where he picks that back up. He says, now therefore, as through, like he said in 12, and you're waiting for the so also. He digresses, and then he picks it back up. He says, now therefore, as through the trespass of one man, condemnation came to all people. That's what he was saying. So also, ah, there it is. <laughs> 
There it is. So also, through the righteous deed of one man, the pronouncing righteous that leads to life came to all people. Okay, so I think it's important to to recognize that and to see that. Now, we're not going to jump down there. We're going to kind of work our way through here, but there's much to say. Uh, Paul says that sin, which he personifies and he speaks of, he personifies, he speaks of sin as an entity. Capital S. He personifies sin, speaks of it as an entity, and he says, sin entered into the human world into the human stream through Adam and death entered through sin. So here he is, sin enters the world through Adam and death enters through sin. Adam, the first man, he's held responsible for introducing this power into the human experience. He's held responsible for that. You know, Paul's well aware of that, that Eve was the one who sinned first, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 1 Timothy 2, 14. But Adam is the representative of mankind in salvation history. Adam is the one, he's the one epidemiologists would call ground zero. He's the one who introduced the plague. And so that's what Paul says there. Death came to Adam as God's righteous judgment on sin. When Adam sinned, God imposed the death penalty which involved spiritual, physical, and eternal death. He imposed the death penalty. Douglas Moo in his commentary says, Paul frequently uses death and related words to designate a physico-spiritual entity, total death. The penalty incurred for sin. Here then, Paul may focus on physical death as the evidence, the outward manifestation of this total death. Or better, he may simply have in mind this death in both its physical and spiritual aspects. Adam died spiritually the day he sinned in that he was alienated from God, who's the source of all life. So this total death, it is spiritual, physical, and eternal. So Adam dies spiritually the day he sinned and then he's alienated from God. You see, he was condemned to die physically that day when he sinned. He was condemned to die physically in that he was excluded from the tree of life which represents God's life-sustaining provision. No one is immortal inherently but God. No one, no one has inherent immortality but God. As Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, God alone is immortal. But God gave mankind a conditional immortality that had mankind not sinned against God, he would have continued to provide them life. They would have gone on. Not because they're inherently immortal, but because God would grant them and invest in them immortality you see so there was this condi- as long as they did that conditional immortality god would have continued to grant them life it's not something that is inherent in them now he, he winds up he, he, and so this is what this idea of being excluded from the tree of life what is it god is no longer going to provide life you now are mortal you have been thrown off the cliff The decision has been made. The question of when you hit the ground is, that's not the point. You are dead. You died spiritually in that you're separated. You have been cut off from God's provision of immortality. So you are now mortal and you are dead. It's just a question of when that actually occurs. So we have spiritual life. We have our spiritual death. We have physical death. And Adam was condemned to die eternally barring forgiveness you see barring forgiveness meaning barring the restoration of spiritual life you see during his now temporary life so unless Adam is reconciled to God what happens to him he will be condemned to hell right because he's alienated from God he sins he's alienated from God he's cut off from God's provision of immortality he's now mortal is going to die as sure as I stand here And, barring restoration of physical life, he will be eternally 
condemned. So this is the total death. When Adam sinned, this is big stuff when Adam sins. He experiences this judgment of total death, and that's the same thing that happens to us when we sin. Now, I know the bell's going to ring. It's very difficult the way these things get busted up because this is something I really would like to give to you in one sitting, but you can only take so much, (laughs) you see, because it's just hard to chop this kind of stuff up, but I'm going to talk till the bell rings, and then we'll pick back up, and I'll try to get back to where we were. But this is what I'm going to say. is the same thing that happens to us when we sin. You've got to listen to this because I, I think this is the right track. God sentences us when we sin. He sentences us to total death. Spiritual, physical, and eternal. We die spiritually in that we're alienated from God and we are condemned to die physically and eternally. In other words, for the unforgiven sinner... Even physical death is part of God's punishment. And you're thinking, wait a minute now. I know that a lot of people who aren't sinners die, and forgiven people die. Babies die, babies die and Christians die. Okay, but that's, the point is not to say that those without sin, see the unaccountable infants, those who are unaccountable because of moral defect, or the forgiven Christians, it's not to say that they won't die. You see, death is the lot of mankind. I mean, I know that. Babies die sometimes, and Christians will all die physically unless the Lord returns before them. And then those who are there at that time will what? Be transformed. Okay? But they will, oh. All right, the the difference is that, let me get this sentence out, then I'll shut up. Okay, the difference is that those without sin, the unaccountable, and those who who have been forgiven... For them, physical death is merely a consequence of Adam's sin, not a punishment for it. It is a consequence. I'll I'll say this again, but let me tell you. it's, It's like if you have husband and wife murderers who are convicted and sentenced to a remote island, and they have children born on that island to them. The children live on that island as a consequence of their parents' crime, not as punishment for it. And there is a difference. Okay, there is a difference. Anyway, big stuff. I'm going to hack my way through it. I heard that bell. Thanks.